Welcome back, brothers and sisters, and thank you for joining me again. Human beings have something deep within their nature that compels them to sacrifice. In the modern world, to sacrifice has come to mean surrendering something of value for the benefit of another person or perhaps even of one's country. Like when parents give up luxury and live a simple life to pay for their child's education or when a soldier dies in battle. But for most of history, to sacrifice was to make an offering, usually a costly one, to a deity or a king. The first verse of Leviticus begins with a demand for God. He begins by saying, when you bring a sacrifice and not if you bring a sacrifice. He has just delivered the nation from oppression, revealed himself to them in majesty and shown his presence among them so it's only a natural response for them to sacrifice. Sacrifices were quite common in the ancient world to appease a reluctant deity to win their favor. The sacrifices of Israel were different because they were provisions for them to receive grace from God. They were not merely limitations of the Gentile sacrificial systems, but came with strict regulations prescribed by and with personal revelations from God. Let us learn prayerfully what those sacrifices mean for the lives of the people of Israel. Dear friend, welcome to Through the Bible. Once again, we are here to study the Word of God. Yes, we are in Leviticus and uh, we did the introduction in our last study and today we will focus on chapter 1. Now, this is the oldest offering known to man. Which offering is this? The burnt offering. It was the offering of Abel, Noah and Abraham. All the offerings were made on the brazen altar. But, but because the burnt offering was made there, the brazen altar is also called the burnt altar. It received its name from this sacrifice, the burnt offering. This offering is recorded first of the five offerings because of its prominence and priority. This offering is a picture of Christ in depth as well as in death. A man cannot probe the full meaning or the full extent of the meaning of this offering because it sets before us what God sees in Christ. We can't see as much as He does. Here is a profound mystery that only the Holy Spirit can reveal to us. The burnt offering shows the person of Christ. He is our substitute. Paul reveals this in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 and walk in love Ephesians 5 2 and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Leviticus chapter 1 and verse 1 And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation saying, God called unto Moses out of the tabernacle. No longer is he speaking from the top of Mount Sinai in thunder and lightning as when he gave the commandments. Here he is calling out to Moses from the tabernacle in reconciliation. And the Lord called. His call is for those who will hear his voice. Now that is important to see. God is calling to men today to be reconciled to him. Remember, church is a called out body and they are the elect because they are called. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verses 22 to 24 it says, For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block, and unto the Greeks foolishness. But unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. Now the word called. Called doesn't mean those who only hear. It means those who have heard and responded. I'd like to ask you this question. Have you heard him? 
And have you responded to him? Now that's something for you to think about. Now let's move on to verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, If any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd and of the flock. Now, if any man means whosoever will may come. Now, verse 3 says, If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will. This is free will with a vengeance. The Lord Jesus said, If any man thirst, let him come. This is an all-inclusive invitation to the human race, to the human family. None are excluded except those who exclude themselves. The Lord Jesus gives only one condition, if any man thirst. You may say, I don't thirst. Well, then maybe this isn't for you. But if you have that kind of thirst, he asks you to come to him, and he will and he can satisfy you. Ho, oh, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. Isaiah 55 verse 1. Anyone can come to Christ if he chooses to come. All that they need is to have that desire. There must be a need and a desire. If you have that, then come. Two types of animals were used for the burnt offerings. Animals of the herd are cattle and of the flock are sheep. Wild animals that were animals of prey were excluded. Carnivorous animals were forbidden in all sacrifices. Animals that live by slaying other animals could never reveal Christ him to give his life a ransom for many. A further restriction was that the animal must be a clean animal and it must be domesticated. Now it could not be taken in the hunt. Only that which was valuable and dear to the owner could be offered because it prefigures Christ. God spared not his own son, Christ suffered on the cross, but the Father suffered in heaven as well. The final restriction reveals that the animal was one that was obedient to man. Now, what a picture this is. Christ was the obedient servant. He came to minister and he was obedient even unto death. The burnt offering is the offering that is mentioned up to the time of Leviticus and it was the only offering that was made by those who wanted an approach to God. The burnt sacrifice is called Ola in the Greek. It means that which ascends. It is not irreverent to say that the burnt sacrifice went up in smoke. It was wholly consumed on the altar. Nothing remained but the ashes. This reveals that the burnt offering is what God sees in Christ. Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2 that Christ gave himself an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 2. Here in Leviticus chapter 1 we find in verses 9, 13 and 17 that the sacrifice is a sweet savor unto the Lord. This is what God sees in Christ. It may not be what you see in Him or what I see in Him. It is what God sees in Him. And that is the thing which is all important. God is saying that He is satisfied and with what Jesus did for your sins and, and for my sins as well. God is satisfied that Jesus has paid it all, all for you, and that He can save you to the uttermost if you will put your trust in Him. Now the question is, are you satisfied with that? You will notice that it says the sacrifice is to be a male. And now that speaks of strength. It speaks of the fact that the Lord Jesus is mighty to save and that He is able to save to the uttermost. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25. Then the sacrifice was to be made 
or was to be without blemish, which means the animal was to be ideally perfect. This speaks of the perfections of Christ. 1 John chapter 3 verse 5 says, In him is no sin. Who did no sin? 1 Peter 2 verse 22. Who knew no sin? That is 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 21. Who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners? That is Hebrews chapter 7 verse 26. He is the beloved son of whom the father could say, I am well pleased. Matthew 3.17 ASV, that is the American Standard Version of 1901. That's what it says. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will, which is translated as accepted before Jehovah in the American Standard Version of 1901. Because of the atoning death of the little animal, the sinner was received by God. The animal had to be offered, not in life, but in death. This was absolutely imperative. It is not the spotless life of Christ and our approval of him that saves us. No, not at all. Dear friend, listen. It is only his death that can save the sinner. Now, in the Gospels, we find that when he died, the veil of the temple was torn in two. It was his death, dear friend, which opened the way to God. It was his death which saves the sinner. You see, the veil represents his flesh. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 20. His perfect life shuts us out from God. What God demands is a life that is a perfect, that is perfect like the life of Christ. And you and I can't reproduce it. His life is the standard. The Father could say concerning Jesus. Matthew 3.17 This is is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. You and I just can't measure up to that. No, not at all. The life of Christ therefore cannot save us. It shuts us out from God just as the veil shut man out from God in the tabernacle. We must have another basis on which we can come to God. That way is through the death of Christ. That is what tore the veil. The minute you and I come through the death of Christ, the way to God is open. It is the death of Christ that saves the sinner. The offering was to be brought of his own voluntary will. You don't have to come to Christ, but if you want to be saved, then you are responsible. Then you would have to come to Christ. God has no other way. The Lord Jesus said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14, 6. You may think that this is quite dogmatic and narrow. Well, I'll tell you something. It is. But the interesting thing is that it will bring you to God. Now, you don't have to come. That is where your free will enters in. You do not have to come. But if you want to come to God, then you must come this one way because God has elected that this is the only way. You cannot come to God on the basis of your own righteousness. He cannot accept your righteousness. He won't have any of it. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. At the door of the tabernacle is another imperative. They couldn't offer the sacrifice anywhere else. This was to keep Israel free from idolatry. They were prone to lapse into idolatry again and again and finally it caused or their idolatry was the reason for the Babylonian captivity. And this, my dear friend, by the way, has a message for us. It is to keep us from presuming that we can come to God our way and on our own terms. Now we do not make the terms by which we come to God. God makes the terms, my friend, as Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, But we are all as unclean things, and all our righteousness are as filthy rags. God won't accept our righteousness. A great many people think that the righteousness of God is just a projection on a little higher level of the righteousness of man. Nothing of the kind. It is altogether holy. 
The only righteousness which God can accept is the righteousness of God, which is through faith in Christ. You can't work for it. You can't buy it. God cannot accept our poor righteousness. It will simply go down the drain. The offering must be at the door of the tabernacle. Friends, there is no other way to come to God but His way. The Lord Jesus said, No man cometh unto the Father but by me. John 14 verse 6. Leviticus chapter 1 verse 4 now. And he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. He shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering. Now, Dr. Kellogg calls this an act of designation. Now, this is revealed in Leviticus chapter 24, verse 14, where the witnesses were to lay their hands on the blasphemer before he was stoned to death. Moses, remember, laid his hands on Joshua, designating him as his successor. Dr. Kellogg wrote a very fine book on Leviticus, which may be out of print now, but you could probably find it in some good libraries or in some good stores. Now here is a quotation from it. He is speaking of the laying on of the hand upon the head of the animal, and he says it symbolized a transfer according to God's merciful provision of an obligation to suffer for sin from the offerer to the innocent victim. Henceforth, the victim stood in the offerer's place and was dealt with accordingly. Now, in other words, when the man went in and put his hand on the head of that little animal that was to be slain, he was actually designating this little animal to take his place. The man was confessing that he deserved to die. Friends, now when you take Christ as your Savior, you are saying that you are a sinner and that you cannot save yourself. You want to turn from your sins and you want to turn to the Savior and you want to live for Him. The little animal was dying a substitutionary death in the place of the offerer. Now this is what Christ did for us. When you accept or recognize Christ or make him Lord and Savior of your life, you put your hand, you put your hand on him. That is, you designate him as your Savior. People today seem to have the idea that there is some merit in the act of laying on of hands. They think that there is some transfer of power. No, the only thing that can be transferred by laying on of hands is disease germs. But, but it does designate someone who is taking your place. Now when we as church leaders place our hands on a person who is going out to any other place or is going to take up some specific responsibility, no, as the church in Antioch did to Paul and Barnabas, what are we actually doing? We are designating him or that individual to go out in our place and as our representative. Christ took our place. This is what it means when it says, He hath made him to be sin for us. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21 And who was delivered for our offenses. Romans 4 verse 25 the Hebrew here means to lay the hand so as to lean heavily upon another. Thy wrath lieth hard upon me. Psalm 88 verse 7. This part of the ceremony speaks of the atonement and acceptance through the death of the victim. It shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. We have said before that atonement means to cover, not to remove. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 4 Only the Lamb of God can remove sin. This offering was done publicly. He went down to the tabernacle. He walked to the side of the altar and there he slew the little animal. It was a public act. A sinner needs to confess Christ publicly. By faith we place our hand on Christ but the public needs to know that we do it. 
I think this is primarily the meaning of baptism today. Baptism means to be identified with. There are wrong connotations right now, but dear friend, it means to be immersed completely. This is a public confession of being identified with Christ in his death and in his resurrection. This is the reason the immersion in water was so important in the early church. Well, dear friend, we've come to the close of our study and I hope you've learned some definite lessons, especially about how Moses was once again summoned into the presence of God who had taken residence in the midst of Israel's camp. He was to instruct him on how to implement the laws he had given and with which the people could regulate their daily lives. He wanted them to live a holy life and the key to holiness lays in the demands of the separation and purity. The Israelites in their lifestyle were to distinct from those around them in how they worship, what they ate, how they love, and in their dealings with each other. They were to be governed by ideas of purity. At the very heart of the understanding of holiness was the call to reflect the character of their God in their lives. I am holy, therefore you are to be holy. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Music